unmute ourselves now, probably. Yeah. Yeah, we're, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi, and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at Politics and Pros. Thank you for joining us and turning into this virtual format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of hosting our event this morning in celebration of Earth Day, and I am delighted to welcome our guests, Deborah Hopkinson and Chuck Kroenig. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items for everyone. You can click the link that we will drop into the chat in just a few minutes here to get your own copy of Only One. It's a beautiful book. And if you have questions for our guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add a question there at any time. If you're joining us from school, please add your first name, your school name, and your grade to your question so we can give you a shout out. And just a quick reminder that the chat box has been disabled. Please only use the Q&A section for questions for our guests. At the end of the presentation, they will have some time to answer your questions. You can also upvote the questions you like and want most answered. Now onto the event that you have been waiting for. Deborah Hopkinson is the author of over 50 books, fiction and nonfiction for young readers, including Sweet Clara and the Freedom Quilt, A Letter to My Teacher, Sky Boys, How They Built the Empire State Building, and Abe Lincoln Crosses a Creek, A Tall Thin Tale. She has won many awards for her work, including a Golden Kite Award for Picture Book Text, the International Reading Award for Young People, and the Green Earth Book Award. Deborah received a BA in English from the University of Massachusetts and an MA in Asian Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She lives near Portland with her family and a menagerie of pets. <laughs> Chuck Kronick is the illustrator of dozens of children's books, including 16 Words, Hank's Big Day, Honey, the Dog Who Saved Abe Lincoln, and William's Winter Nap. Chuck grew up in the Netherlands, where he spent his formative years climbing trees, drawing, reading, and cycling. He attended the Artes Institute of Visual Arts in Campen, graduating from his Department of Illustration in 2004. Since 2010, he has resided in the United States, going from Portland, Oregon to Kinderhook, New York, where he lives with his wife, dog, three cats, and several rowdy chickens. <laughs> it is my pleasure to turn the event over to them. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to start, and, um, and I have the pleasure of actually um, reading uh, the book to you on this Earth Day, and then uh, you will hear from the person who makes it look as beautiful as it does. And what I'm going to do is show you some slides. So I'm going to um, move over, which sometimes takes a little while. And it's interesting that both Chuck and I have chickens because I'm sitting in my dining room where often outside my window, you will be able to hear my chickens. So I'm going to see if we can get my slideshow up in the beginning. All right, can anyone see the picture of only one on the slides? Yes. Yes, all right. Well, we want to thank Politics and Prose and um, Random House for helping us celebrate only one on Earth Day itself. So happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, I have written other stories about plants, animals, and our world, and um, I'm especially glad to be have written this one. Um, and I'm going to start out and read it to you. And as I read, I would love you to look carefully at, there's two parts to the story. There's the words and there's the pictures. And many times um, authors get to see the sketches ahead of time. But for some reason, this one, I actually didn't. So when I opened it up for the first time, it was a surprise for me, just like it's going to be a surprise for you. One, only one. The story starts with one. All right, where did it go? A long, long time ago, nearly 14 billion years, one tiny speck exploded with a big bang to become everything. We call this everything our universe. Our universe contains so many hot and glowing balls, no one can count them all. To us, they look like small, bright points of light twinkling in the sky. 
we call these points of light stars. All through the vast sea of space, gigantic clusters of stars light up the darkness. We call these clusters galaxies. There may be two trillion galaxies in the universe or even more. Some have names that match their shapes, cartwheel and sunflowers, sombrero and tadpole. Only one star is our home. Only one galaxy is our home. We call our home the Milky Way. The Milky Way contains at least 100 billion stars. Most are so far away. We can only see them through a telescope. Even on the darkest night, we're lucky if we can see 4,000 stars with our own eyes. Where are these kids all going, do you think? But during the day, only one bright star shines in the sky. Only one star is close enough to give us warmth and light. We call this star our, say it together, our sun. Eight large spinning balls circle or orbit the sun. We call these balls planets. Only one is our home, our one and only planet. We call it Earth. We call the other planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And there they all are. Some have balls called moons that orbit around them. Earth has only one. We call it simply the moon. The eight planets and their moons all orbit the sun. So do a few small dwarf planets. Rocks called asteroids and icy, dirty snowballs with long, dusty tails called comets. We call the sun and all these swirling, zooming objects our solar system. The Earth has a special layer around it. It makes it possible for us to breathe, for rain to fall, and for plants to grow. We call this layer the atmosphere. Oh, they're looking up at the sky. Can you see them? I'm not sure what the sky is like in your town, but right now it's blue here. Earth also has several, seven huge pieces of land called continents, five great bodies of water called oceans, and many rivers, lakes, and streams. And there you can see the continents taking shape right on the ground there. It has mountains, deserts, islands, volcanoes, canyons, and rainforests. Where are they going, do you think? 8,700,000 different kinds of creatures live on Earth. We call each kind of creature a species. Earth has more than 10,000 species of birds, 25,000 species of fish, and 100,000 species of bugs. It has trees, great and small, flowers of all colors, vegetables, mosses, mushrooms, mammals, and thousands of tiny, tiny creatures. Some are too small to see with our own eyes. And so we use a microscope to investigate. I bet you like to investigate. Our earth holds all this life along with us, more than 7 billion human beings. Can you see where they're going to now? But though there are 7 billion of us, we are each unique with bodies, brains, fingerprints, and feelings all our own. Around the world, people wear different clothes, eat different foods, and speak many languages. Yet together, we are part of one human family and the great diversity of life. One, only one. Earth is our one and only planet to care for, love, and preserve. One, only one, the story ends where it began with only one. And today on Earth Day, I'm going to go to my garden and plant this plant you can see here, which is called a milkweed, because that's the kind of plant that monarch butterflies like. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Chuck. Hi there. So what you just heard and saw was the complete story. But when I became involved in making this book, all I got were the words. There were no pictures yet. So what happened was when the editor sent me the text and I said like, oh, this is a fun text. I'd, like to, I'd love to make a book out of this one. I had to start sketching it. So what happens is, when I do this, I start 
making what is called a storyboard. This is what it looks like in the beginning. Of course, you don't know what this is and nobody who isn't me, who isn't me really understands what's going on here, but this is the first overview of the whole book. And at this point, all I did was figure out like, oh, the a little bit of text should go here. And then there should be a big bang over there and so on. Chuck, we can't see your screen. Oh, you can't. Nope. Oh, I see, I forgot to click share. <laughs> there we go. I think now you can see, right? Yes, looks great. Yes. And can you see my cursor too? Um, no, but I can see you going through the screens. Okay. Well, so, all right. So this is what a storyboard looks like, which is just some very quick scribbles for me to figure out what the rhythm of the pictures and the text should be. And then, Originally, I had this idea of showing people looking at the universe. So the telescopes and observatories and microscopes. And then I thought, well, that's kind of boring. Like then it's just the text that describes what things, and then the book is just, oh, this is what things are like. And I wanted it to be a little bit more active. So I thought, of uh, this kid who describe who describe who tells all this to her friends because when I was probably your age, I loved reading about the universe and what I loved even more was telling everyone about the stuff I had just read. So I thought, you know what? Let's make it like that. So this is what the first sketches looked like. And then, because of course, this is very messy, I can't send this to the editor yet. And the editor is the person who is sort of in charge of making sure that text and pictures and, all, and everything all go together well, and then actually gets the book published. So here we have the first sketches. And I have this girl on the phone describing a tiny speck that's going to explode with a big bang. And then she rings a doorbell. As you can see, none of this is actually in the book because this is just my first version. Like for example, here we're describing the planets and I have them playing around with them, which is an idea I still like. And then they describe Earth also has seven huge pieces of land called continents. And I thought I'll just zoom out from our big planet and you can see all these things. Here we have the final page of the book. Again, very different from how it ended up being. So then after your editor gives you some feedback, you start over and you come up with a slightly different version. So here we have this first day, this second version of the sketches, and you can see probably there's a little card here that says Earth Day, because I already thought that would be appropriate then. She throws a jacket on what is now her brother. Again, See, slightly different from how it ended up being. Now, instead of like an, um, a vague piece of the planet, you can see the continent. I think this is the one you call America, where we're all living. And in this version, they're not going to plant trees, they are going to a museum. But, and the, but we didn't really like that idea of just showing the, the stuff that's in uh, on the earth with all the different people and places because 
there's a difference between like learning and doing. And I thought this book was, should be about taking care of our earth. So I wanted, really wanted to show them planting those trees at the end. See, this one is even closer to the eventual illustration in the book. And just to show you how often a sketch can change, can be changed. So this is our page with the seven, with the continents in the first version, second sketch, third sketch, fourth sketch, fifth sketch, sixth, seven, eight. So that's how many times I had to redo this sketch before we found a version we all liked. And I think this is pretty fun for Deborah too, if she, because she said she hasn't, she never actually saw the sketches. She know, now she knows how many versions of this book there were before it became the final version. And I don't have any it, pictures of how I made these illustrations, but here is a little time lapse of how I draw. And guess what animal this is? I would be, well, I'll be a little impressed. So, if you guys remember, there's the tree planting at the end of the book. And that's something I used to do sometimes, not just on Earth Day. See here, and this is exactly sort of what's like and what it's like in the book. And you know, sometimes you meet old friends there. You want to know what this guy is? And you know that this is a tree planting in, in this group here somewhere. And it's a lot of fun, except, you know, when you don't have to plant trees, but for example, throw dead fish in the water to feed all the little guy, all the little guys who live in the water. This is a very stinky job and I would not recommend it. So that is how I created this book and it's one of many I've made. Some of them you may have seen, some of them are about animals, some of them are about history. And here are some of my little friends who help out, who sometimes help out and sometimes don't help out. So if anyone has any questions, if Deborah has any questions, maybe that would be interesting. Well, I love seeing these sketches. And um, um, at what point did uh, the idea of the journey to the tree planting come to you? Did it come because you were working on them or did it happen like, like all at once, like a big bang? <laughs> it was kind of an all at once moment. Like I, I think I was on a hike and I was wandering around in like a forest and thought it would be why why isn't that in the book and <laughs> I just had this idea of like what if what if this is about like kids going on their way and there's this little girl who tells all this stuff to her friends so then I had to like work like try and work out how it would all fit and that I think was the, that took the longest because like it, there's nothing in the text to suggest that this is going on. So I had to like work the, this other story around your text. Um, I know Heidi's going to help us with the questions and answers. So um, um, as Heidi comes back on, I would just say that many times uh, students ask me, how do I work with an illustrator? And I often say that 
it's um, it's always a complete surprise because a picture book is really a collaboration that sometimes doesn't happen um, even in the same place. <laughs> so it's it is like a wonderful like like the way like we we raise baby canaries and right now we have two and we never know what they're going to come out like until they appear. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Chuck, if you don't mind screen, stopping your screen share, I will go to the oh. question for everybody. Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's get started here. So the first question is from St. Alexander School, North Bay, Ontario, grade five, six, class of me, uh, Miss D. Agostino. And they want to know how long does it take to illustrate a book? So Chuck, that one's for you first. Well, sometimes it can take a long time like six months, sometimes it takes a lot less time, but it is it, but from start to finish, from me getting the text to the book actually being in your hands, it can be like a year and a half. Mm. And my part in that can sometimes take up to a year, but I don't work on one book at the same time. So what usually happens is I'm making the illustrations for one book when I get, when it's time to start the sketches for the next book. And then there's a waiting time where like I send my sketches to the editor who is sort of like the invisible per third person in this collaboration. <laughs> it's very appropriate that the editor is not here, but <laughs> you can't make a book without them. And so these things go back and forth and then I make the illustrations and then they come back with all sorts of comments, which are like, well, I don't know if this person should be on this side of the page or not. And sometimes, but sometimes it's like, you drew this person with four fingers here and then on that page with five fingers. <laughs> God. Like, yes, I did. <laughs> so we, one of the really neat things is when we have illustrators on, we like to know like some inside things. So we were talking in the green room before you joined earlier and we were saying, we were wondering why you chose for the main character to have a yellow jacket. Could you maybe talk about that? Uh, well, I can, if you saw in one of the first sketches, she had a blue jacket, but I mainly picked yellow because it contrasts, it stands out from other things. It was only like a secondary thought, so thought that that is also the rain cup color that Greta Thunberg is famous for. Mm -hmm. But that was, which is also kind of why I wanted to give her a blue jacket at first because I didn't want to make it a very obvious parallel. Hmm. And it was a rain jacket because I, because rain jacket, first of all, a rain jacket is nice and big. So it's like the one piece of clothing that you have to draw. It makes things a little easier. And in my head, this book is set in Portland, Oregon. So I figured, oh, it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, let's see. The next question is from Dolphin Class, second grade in Washington, DC. Are all the facts in this book true? So Deborah, that's for you. How did you learn the facts that you wrote about in this book? Well, that's a good question. I write lots of nonfiction and sometimes they're longer books. So my new book is um, called The Deadliest Hurricane. So if you like to read nonfiction, you can read shorter books and longer books, but whether it's short or long, I try to check all my facts. So um, sometimes we also have somebody like an expert come and check, but there are probably things that change, right? So sometimes the population of the earth is changing and we might discover new species and sadly we might lose species. So one of the things that I checked really carefully here was do twins have different fingerprints, identical twins. And I had to check that by looking at science articles and they might start out with the same, but just when they're still, before they get born and they're inside the mom, um, even that changes a little bit of the fingerprints. So even twins have different fingerprints. So that's something I learned. <laughs> Fascinating, neat. Okay, let's see. We have a couple of different questions that want to know about your pets. So let me just do shout outs here. So Mr. Rosa's class asks, how many pets do you have? And do they inspire your artwork? And then a similar question from um, 
I think it is uh, Miss Scoobles third grade class at Lafayette. They're curious about the pets and your background. They want to know their name. So if you could maybe tell us a little bit about your pets. Deborah, do you want to start with your pets and then we'll let Chuck talk about how they might influence him. Actually, what I'm going to do um, is pick up um, Rue. Hold on a second. Okay. And this is little Rue. Can you all see her? Yes, hello Rue. So Rue is quite special because she sits beside me and helps me, but I also put her into my books. So her name in How I Became a Spy is LR, or little Rue. And she's going to be in my the book I'm working on right now. And her name is going to be Mouse King. So we also have canaries, a dog, a cat, two chickens, and fish. Nice. I love it. It is quite the menagerie. <laughs> um, when Chuck comes back, I will make sure I ask him the same question. But um, so, oh, oh, here we go. Here. I have... <laughs> <laughs> two cats in this room this is this one is called teasel Teasel. <laughs> he is about one year old and then we have hazel the dog hi hazel, hi, hazel. five years old and very lazy mm. and then that over there is trilby the cat Great name. and then somewhere else in the house there's another cat who is always hiding and outside there are four chickens. So that is the somewhat excessive amount of animals we have around here. You can never have and a lot of times the cats and the dog find their ways into books. I was trying to find one of my books that is somewhere around here, which I drew Hazel. And there's oh. always a cat somewhere in the background, but except, for, except maybe for this book, because most of it is set in nature and I like to keep. And I'm a very big fan of indoor cats because cats eat birds and I like to make sure that we have as many birds outside as possible. Yes. Oh, and to go back to the previous question about whether all the facts in this book are correct, I tried very hard to make sure that all the animals in the book are correct to where the book is set. So I made sure that like the birds, the snails, et cetera, they're all in the right environment. Nice, that is a great detail, thank you. Let's see, we, our next question is from Lafayette third grade, Miss Vessa's class. And she wrote, uh, we loved seeing all of your sketches. We were wondering how long you have been illustrating for Chuck. So I graduated art school in 2004. And I illustrated my first picture book in 2010. So I've been illustrating picture books for almost 12 years. Yeah, nice. Let's see, the next question is from Miss MacArthur's third grade at Lafayette. And uh, this is for Deborah. How did the writing influence your illustrations? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that <laughs> or both of you, I guess, because Chuck, you got her script and then you, yeah. Can you maybe talk about your collaboration process at all, the two of you? Sure. Oh, there was so, none. <laughs> yeah. so basically, many times, not always, but for me, because I don't illustrate my own books and I don't have um, a partner, sometimes um, people who um, are married might, or have friends might do a book together, but usually the idea comes from my head and I'm like a little snail, right? My ideas come from the same place that yours do, things that happen to me. I can't remember how I got this idea because I think I've been researching climate change. Um, and because I live in Oregon and I used to work um, with climate scientists at my job because I had a, a real job too at Oregon State University uh, raising money for projects to help the earth. So it just happened. And then our editor is Ann Schwartz and she is the one who takes the manuscript and has me do the same thing that Chuck do, lots and lots of drafts until the words are right. Then she decides who would be a good illustrator. And she then um, sends it to Chuck um, and then he can say yes or no. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about having an editor because if you were to ask me and I wouldn't have liked it, it would have been very rude. <laughs> <laughs> to just be like, sorry, Deborah, no, thank you. 
<laughs> okay, let's see. The next question is um, from the second graders in the dolphin class, and they are currently researching and writing nonfiction books about endangered animals. Nice. Uh, and they would like to know, do you have any advice for them on making the illustrations realistic and accurate? Oh, good question. Oh, good question. Well, realistic and accurate. Mm. Well, I would say realistic isn't very important. Accurate is maybe important. Uh, for, for me, what it's about is making the illustrations interesting or making the illustrations tell a story. So I think if you're making a nonfiction story about an endangered animal, if you wanted to draw, make the illustrations for that, I would say, think about what you think is important about that. Because if you wanted to make, if you wanted to draw the animal, you can always look at pictures of the animal and see like, oh, is it that shade of blue on its feathers? Or is it the stripes on it go like that? You can, those, are, those are kind of the simple things, even though, you know, making it look like the animal it is, that's kind of, yeah, that's a little bit hard, but it's not the most important part of your illustration. So nice. make it interesting for yourself and make it fun. Chuck, do you ever use photos um, as models? Um, yeah. For, for things like color and just for like for this book, like for or for any nonfiction book, I like to do a lot of research. So for this book, I was looking at a lot of pictures by the Hubble telescope and just like all in pictures of the planets and the galaxies, and things like that. Awesome. Let's see, our question from Katie G is asking, I'm gonna ask this of Deborah because you know it was you didn't see anything until the final product. So um, she wants to know what spread of illustrations um, ended up being your favorite. Oh, that is so hard. I think, <laughs> um, I think my favorite, well, I have actually two favorites. Um, I really like, I have three favorites. I really like when they are um, drawing the continents, this one here, because, um, and especially now that I see Chuck's different ideas, I love that they're actually like <clears throat> out investigating. And then I think my other favorite um, one is, um, is when they look up at the sun and we think that we take um, take the universe and realize how lucky we are to have one sun that makes everything um, on earth possible with warmth. So, but I have many, I have many favorites. Um, sometimes I get a chance to ask um, to purchase artwork from um, an illustrator. So this will be very hard to decide which one I might want. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see. We ha also have several, or at least a couple questions about um, Chuck. They want to know, let's see, Mrs. W Williman's class from Lafayette, uh, and they want to know at what age did you know you wanted to be an, uh, an illustrator? And actually that goes for you too, Deborah, when you wanted to be an author. And then um, there's another class who, um, Ms. MacArthur's class wanted to know how you started as an illustrator. So Chuck, do you want to go first and talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um... I didn't know I wanted to be an illustrator until I went to art school, I think. No, it was a little earlier. I think it was when I was in high school and I read Lord of the Rings and spent a lot of time drawing, thing, drawing things from it. But I'd always been drawing. Like I'd always been drawing and painting, but before that, I think I wanted to be a paleontologist, an archeologist, a baker, a forest ranger, a psychiatrist and then I decided that all of those things seemed maybe a little hard so illustration and, but illustration seemed the most fun mm. good decision Deborah how about you well I wanted to be a writer when I was in fourth grade um, mm -hmm. but it took me a long time and I always tell students um, you might want to do something but it might not come out the way you want so I had a regular job for many years up until eight years ago um, and, um, what I really like to write, um, one reason I like to write is I always learn something, right? So even if it's, um, 
if it's a nonfiction book or uh, short or long, I'm always learning. And that's um, writing is hard, but also fun that way. Awesome. I'm sure there are a lot of kids on here who are interested in being illustrators and authors, so it's good advice. Okay, let's see. We also have another question from St. Alexander's North, a school in North Bay, Ontario, grade five, six class. Is being an illustrator a full-time job? And do you, as an illustrator, give ideas to the writer about the written story of the book? Oh, interesting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, where is this? I could. <laughs> um... It is my full-time job, although for a while I also worked at a library, but it became, a I was, illustration took more time than I had time to work at the library for, but it was very fun to work at a library because I could make, I could read my own books to other people. Um, and, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question again? <laughs> Oh, I just dismissed it. Sorry. I think it was a full-time job. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I just dismissed it. I got, I just got thinking about the library again. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I missed the second part of it. Let's, let's just go on to another question that I can swing back yeah. around. I missed that one. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, this is a question from Ms. Scoobles, Sco Scoobell, thank you, third grade class. Would you tell us about your writing process? How do you come up with your ideas, Deborah? Um, uh, the other part of that question was, um, does the illustrator give ideas to the writer? Ah, yes. Um, oh, yes. Um, <laughs> and I have to say, occasionally that does happen, but, um, uh, and mo most of the time I try very much to do them um, when I can. Sometimes. Every, that's why an editor is like in the middle. So um, if the illustrator has an idea, but she's not really she or he isn't really sure it's going to work, maybe they'll pass it on to the writer, but sometimes not. Oh, interesting. Um, and my ideas, I get them from the same place that students, you get your ideas from um, things that happen to me, places I go. Um, many times I get my ideas from other books. So I'm the kind of person that likes to read the back of books, which is the index. And many times for my longer books, I get ideas from things that happened in the past. So this is a book that came out this year called We Must Not Forget about mm -hmm. World War II. And in that case, I use the experiences of real people. So some of my books also have ideas of how you can be a writer. And for um, The Deadliest Hurricanes, it tells students how to go about doing an oral history with someone in your family. Um, and the first book in that is about being a chronicler. So how do you chronicle or make a diary of your experience? So I'm always trying to find a way to help um, writer, young writers become interested in writing too. Thank you. Let's see, we have a question from Mr. Howard's class at Lafayette, third grade, and they said, we are fascinated by the sketching process. How hard is it to sketch the drawings to match the words written by the author? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. um, that's different every time because sometimes a book is a simple story where your illustrations are just show what's going on and sometimes you want to do a little more you want to tell a story in the illustrations that sort of contrasts with the text so you get a little bit of interplay between them so in this one in my initial version i was i just thought like okay show the big bang show the, sun, the universe show the galaxy show the sun the planets etc 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 and it was kind of boring because it was exactly what was going on in the text and so i was thinking about what was important to me in this story and i really thought like it is that last it's that last paragraph basically in the book that says earth is our only one to take care of and that I thought was the most important and I think from that came the idea of showing these kids and also because when I was younger I did a lot of volunteering with an organization from the World Wildlife Fund so I, so I think 
it just came naturally to me to think about like, okay, what can kids do to say to help? Yeah, I think what you're explaining between the words and illustration, that's when the magic happens, right? When the words are beautiful and the illustrations really elicit this response, I think that's where the magic is. So thank you for talking about that a little bit. Uh, let's see, we have a question from R. Lynn Bennett Barnett. Uh, and the question is, I've seen some picture books start on the right side of the book and some on the left. Is there a rule for that? Also, I've seen some with title pages and others not. Is there a rule for that too? There are no rules, <laughs> but what there are, are the amount of pages in a book and the amount of money to get the book printed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have all the space in the world to draw and make, this, make the book as big as possible. And sometimes it's just a matter of like, oh, you have this amount of pages. So you have to make use of every side of them. So you start on like the left hand side because they're the right hand side isn't available to you so that's why that is it's very practical hmm. got it because i don't because i don't know if you've ever noticed this but most picture books are only 32 pages so we have to spread our work out in exactly that amount of mm. space yeah. yeah save some parameters there well, we are running short on time a little bit here, but we do have one last question I think is a perfect way to end things. And uh, we'll start with Deborah with answering this question, but is from Daisy and she asks, what are some things that kids can think about for helping the planet? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, um, only one has a page of resources in the back of um, ideas for people to do. And um, as Chuck was mentioning, um, volunteering in your own community, and I've written two books that are for kids who um, do want to do things. And Butterflies Belong Here, um, students make a butterfly garden um, at their school, a way station for monarch butterflies, but you can make any kind of garden at your school. And in Follow the Moon Home, um, uh, the students in this book um, go work to um, have the people in their community turn their lights off to help baby sea turtles. So I think the point, though, is to find something in your school or community, whether it's with your church or your school or even your own family, and even just planting like something um, on your windowsill or composting or reminding, being in charge of recycling, all those things um, can help. There's a lot that has to be done and we each have a part to play. Yes, absolutely. And I would add also your local library probably has something going on. Yeah. Some, li some libraries have gardens, some library or commute, or, you know, there are probably also community gardens where you are. So yeah, absolutely. There are all sorts of ways to chip in. Absolutely. And it's so important. We each do our, our part because it does add up. Um, thank you both so much for this really inspiring conversation. Um, I do wanted to mention that the store is doing a really nice uh, program right now. It is a bookmark contest and it is about the, about the earth and what we can do. And um, it's a design, a bookmark that celebrates our planet. And we are accepting applications through the end of April. So if you were inspired by today's talk and book, we encourage you uh, to either come in and get uh, an or a, a little form that you can fill out and return to us. Um, but you can also download the template online today. So hopefully you all are inspired to do that and we can see some of your fantastic ideas. Um, also, there is still time to hop on and grab the book. So please do that and take some time today to think about the earth and how we, we can help the earth. And we thank you both so much for being here and, and giving your time today. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Keep reading. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Bye.